I got my makeup smeared. Thank you. Uh, you know, this morning, Charlie, before I ever come and do a, a talk, he's my practitioner and he does a beautiful prayer for me and, and all of you in support of, of a message coming through that is unfiltered and, and uh, filled with, with the love that, of my intention. And as he was preparing me for it, he was saying, well, you know, you've been through a lot this week, and, and I haven't cried and whined. I have whined a lot about my knee, drank a lot of wine about my knee, but I, there was, I kept just being determined because I am absolutely faithful that it is healing and it is it, the, the prayers of request and of heart. I have such faith and conviction that it is so. I'm just being patient with it, but I tell you, when he opened that doorway of, well, you know, you've been there. I wanted to just start bawling and not show up today because I wanted to really feel sorry for myself. But Mary, <laughs> thank you. That just kind of wraps it all up tight. So I'm, my other leg is just like, you know, I'm not so hot either, but I've been doing pretty good. <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of balancing on one leg. Um, Charlie, could you hand me my phone? I wanted to explain what the uh, gifts for the men are uh, that you received today. And the reason I need my phone is I keep forgetting what, the, how to, what this is. Um, but we bought these for the men in, in honor of Father's Day. So men, uh, I invite you, if you didn't receive one of these small tokens, it's a healing crystal. And it's called, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Shungite. And uh, Mary's going, oh, it gets dark stuff all over you. It is made of a carbon. It's a, it's a mineral, and they found it deep in the caves of Russia, and it's two million years old, something like, yeah, two billion years old, awesome, and they found that it has a purifying quality to it, uh, it is used to uh, break down and purify water, and I thought, you know, that's really what, what the energy of the Father within each one of the men here, uh, for your Father, for you, if you were fortunate to be a Father, or uh, always long to be a father or have been a mentor of, of a child in some way, um, we really do honor you for, for being the purifying force, for being the, the strength of the cleansing, purifying of whatever is going through the need of that child, you have been there for them. So we invite you to, to just take that little piece of, of our respect for you and, and place it upon your altar and then wash your hands. <laughs> Stuff on you. But thank you. It's called Shungite if you wanted to look, look it up a little bit more. So Father's Day, I, the message today, we're following the theme and it's about your spiritual banking account, your spiritual account. And I'm going to weave that into the message, but I was really focusing on Father's Day and, and that energy. So um, I had Dave, the, the sound cue up a little bit of a tape I wanted to share with you because this is one of the most profound stories of father that I remember being struck when I was a child. But when I heard it again through this gentleman's, this Reverend um, Lloyd, he's uh, the, te the, gosh, ugh the minister of the Bodhi Center in Colorado. So I took away his intro because it goes really long because he's really famous, but here is his words and just kind of take it in. So go ahead and we'll just play that little clip and then I'll let him know when to kind of shut it down. Genesis 22, God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, take your son up the mountain and sacrifice him Make him a burnt offering, and I'll show you where to do this. So Abraham is obedient to God. So Abraham gets two of his servants, and he gets his son Isaac. He gets them together, and they go up the mountain, and Abraham takes the wood, and he builds a place where the fire is going to happen, and the burnt offering is going to occur according to God's plan. And it is said in the story that on the third day it was time, so Abraham says to his servants, you stay here. And he says, Isaac, come with me. And I'm thinking, you know, Isaac's like, where are we going, Dad? 
And dad's like, a hike. <laughs> so up the mountain they go. And Abraham, who loves his son, important component of the story, he loves his son. He starts binding his son, wrapping him up, puts him on the fire, and pulls out a knife to slay him. So Isaac's like, Dad, are you killing me? To quote David Alexander, WTF? Here he is. And Abraham, who loves his son, is about to slay him. So an angel appears, and the angel says, no, 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 okay, 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 gigs up, it's fine. We understand, we get it, you're willing to surrender. We get that you put God first before, before all else, so you can have the love of your son. So he unwraps the son, and he lets the son go, and I'm sure the son is like running into the woods, all freaked out, like, not funny, Dad, not funny. not going on a hike with you again. <laughs> so Abraham, the angel says, Abraham, you are obedient. You, God first. You get this and that. The stars, nations shall come from you. Every child shall be blessed. Blessings. Abraham is given the kingdom of heaven for putting God first. Now I imagine, this is my fun little mind, I imagine that Isaac became a drug addict and an alcoholic, and ended up in a treatment center for post-traumatic stress disorder okay. for what That's he had good. to go through. That didn't land in the Bible. <laughs> so, how many of you have heard that story before? Many of you? Never, never heard it before. Well, some. Um, I remember hearing that, and those were the days in my upbringing that that they always gave you just a little bit of um, a little bit of a, a frightening feeling about what don't mess with God, you know. You just really want to do everything to obey God. And then when I got into the spiritual teaching and those, you start to look at the metaphysical meaning behind the the rich stories of the Bible, and that level of surrender, you know, what would it take? And and I've I've heard that story from from different ministers through a lifetime. And I really wonder always, well, what would I be willing to do? What, would, what is my level of absolute surrender? What is that? And to put God absolutely first. So when we, when we speak of the message today of um, knowing that we are absolutely provided for always by the divine, that we have an abundance, we have this bank account, so to speak, of abundant riches. Um, but there's more of a, an idea, not so much of monetary or good that we can materially see, but there is, there's the spiritual wisdom that is ever present. These principles of truth are ours to take, ours to, to say, yes, I will take that one. That truth moves me, touches me, stirs inside of me an awakening, an understanding of my life's journey. I'll take that and plant that seed in my heart. I might need that someday. So you take that and you put it in your account of truth. And then there'll come a time where you are distressed or um, you're thrown off your guard, you're triggered by some life event, and you want to know that you have banked these principles of truth and you rely on the substance of that to restore you to your true nature. That's what the, the, the idea of your spiritual accounts and why we do so much spiritual practice to be invested in the spiritual longing of our heart. And oftentimes you'll see many people come to the center, they're saying, I'm missing something. And I came here and I found it. I found a truth. I found a way. I found a wisdom. I found a message that I'm able to, to understand and to articulate back into my own experience. That's what the, the beauty of this teaching and what Ernest Holmes has brought to us. So all of our wisdoms in this year are taken from this book. And today's message itself, uh, the title, Ernest Holmes spoke to it, Your Spiritual Bank Account. Now I thought maybe at the time he, he made this message, he, people had a lot of trust in banks. <laughs> And I thought his analogies were right on.
But now we have to see, well, is that the kind of spiritual truth? Is that a wisdom that really operates in my life, in my world now? We're much more of a discerning group of fellowship of people. We take information and we really have to work it into our own experience to see if it's true. So I started thinking along with the spiritual bank account idea also, what is father? What is father? What is my father? Mother's Day came and went beautifully for me. I, I love the idea of the divine mother. And then when it comes to, and being a mother is just one of the, the most awesome things ever. Then it comes to father and I couldn't, I started reflecting on my own father and there's this empty void. And I thought, well, what's that? Out of duty, I loved my father. Out of, out of being the child that loves their parent. But I didn't grieve deep when he passed. I, didn't, I don't miss him at Father's Day. And then there's this guilt that rises up in my heart. And then I see in my world the most amazing fathers. The most amazing fathers. Last week, watching uh, Damien be with his daughter during her, her most painful experience of her lifetime when she lost her baby, and him standing and singing a song, and I'm just thinking, wow, what a great dad. What a great dad to be able to have that courage. And I look out at, at all of you right now knowing that you're your children, that you, the fathers, your children, what you have, what you have been able to be an example for them. And I've been, um, you remember Erin Marie, she was a, a practitioner and became a minister up in Bellingham and she was getting married and her father was there and they were dancing. And I remember watching that dad dance and I thought, oh, I wanted a dad like that. And it, all the people that spoke of their fathers with such deep admiration and deep, deep joy, I thought, I wanted a dad like that. And then I started thinking, well, what was my dad? And this idea I shared when I started looking at some of stories about the father. This story came across me. One morning, my father didn't get up to go to work. He went to the hospital and died the next day. I hadn't, hadn't thought that much about him before. He was just someone who left and came home and seemed glad to see everyone at night. He opened the jar of pickles when no one else could. He was the only one in the house who wasn't afraid to go to the basement by himself. He cut himself shaving, but no one ever kissed it or got excited about it. It was understood that when it rained, he got the car and brought it around to the door. When anyone was sick, he went out to get the prescription filled. He took a lot of pictures, but he was never in them. Whenever I played house, the mother doll had a lot to do. I never knew what to do with the daddy doll. So I had him say, I'm going off to work now, and threw him under the bed. The funeral was in our living room, and a lot of people came and brought all kinds of good food and cakes. We had never had so much company before. I went to my room and felt under the bed for the daddy doll. When I found him, I dusted him off and put him on my bed. He never did anything. I didn't know his leaving would hurt so much. That was by Irma Bombeck the ties that bind. And I, I took the filter off of the screen of my heart for my own father and I realized, you know, I think a lot of us grew up with the father that went to work. It was the mother that got us to school and made our lunches and made the meals and kept the house and kept us going to everything that we needed to do. And it really was the father that was the disciplinary, was the um, one that had to go out. I remember my father having to come pick us up at the late nights of, of ball games, football games. He, I remember him being so dang sleepy, you know, driving, because he worked, he, he would commute to work and back two hours every day. And when he got home, his release was the highballs. I don't know what a highball is, whatever vodka is. And he would um, 
drink those. So then when we needed a ride, he was a little bit schnuckered and he'd already fallen asleep. So I remember being in the VW and I was sitting in the back and he almost slammed, uh, rear-ended somebody. And so he slammed on the brakes when I screamed and knocked the wind out of my girlfriend in the front seat and I went through the windshield. But it was just like, that's dad. You know, he was sorry and uh, nobody was hurt. Just our, you know, my head. But I, I, I don't think I ever looked into the deep picture of who, who my father was. So I invite you in this day, if, if some of your Father's Day stories of heart um, aren't the real happy or joyful ones, the, the deeper respect of they did the best they could. And they, I don't know if anybody taught our fathers of our time, of my generation, how to be a father. How, how to be a father. What is it to be a father? There's more information nowadays and, and more participation of father and family. And the first Father's Day, if you didn't realize, 4,000 years ago, and, and they found a, they used to celebrate in the Babylon Times Father's Day. And they found clay cards of messages from sons and daughters to their fathers. And it wasn't until 1909, uh, there was a woman named uh, Louise Dodd that was recognizing, because Mother's Day was always already being celebrated and, and getting a lot of attention. And she realized that she, her mother died when she was born, so her father raised their four children all by himself. And she thought, why don't we ever recognize that? And so she started a campaign, and her father's birthday was in June, so she wanted Father's Day to be celebrated then, but it didn't get actually anointed as a special day until many years later, and it became the third weekend of June, the third Sunday of June. And it was popular with Woodrow Wilson, and um, it wasn't finally until President Nixon established it as a permanent day. And that's just in a, in a lifetime of, it feels like a few years ago. I know it's generations ago, but so this honoring of the father came, came many years, many, many years after celebrating the mother. And we think about the many children that don't have a father, that have um, two dads, perhaps, or maybe two mothers, and or there's been a geographical distance. So it's not always, and I can respect that, not always a day of, of great celebration. But there's always, and we can always recognize when we're doing this, we've turned to a surrogate man to be our father, to be that example of that strength, of that wisdom. And when I think of father, when I think of the spiritual truths that are out in our, in our world, I think about what is it that father gives us and the story of Abraham, that story of this power, this wisdom, this strength. And when we can align ourselves with that father masculine energy of power, wisdom, and strength, and a deep knowing that God has, God the Father has us always held so close and is offering great gifts to us always. So that's what we're honoring, God the Father who's always home, always home. And there's so many, many stories of, of the children that, that I came across of, of examples of the father taken too soon, and, and this one in particular after the assassin, assassination of President Kennedy, his young son, John Jr., asked William Haddad, an associate of JFK's, are you a daddy? Haddad told him that he was. In response, little John Jr. said, then will you throw me in the air? You know, that beautiful innocence of the idea of what a father is to such a, such a sweet child. And this one also, there's a Spanish story of a father and a son who had become estranged. The son ran away and the father set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail and finally, finally in a last desperate effort to find him, the father put an ad in the Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven, and I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their father. 
So these stories endlessly reach into my spiritual bank account of truth. Because the more we open the doors of our heart to these spiritual wisdoms and truth, when we recognize we are so invested in spiritual wisdom and how to use it, I like to look at it, and I speak to the practitioners in, in training so often in that if this is going to go into your spiritual toolkit. Remember this truth. One of my favorite books is one of these that uh, Ernest Holmes put together, Creative Ideas, a Spiritual Compass for, for Personal Expression. And hopefully there's a few copies in the bookstore. But you open up to whatever, whatever it is that you are dealing with in your experience. And there is a wisdom and a prayer and a, a spiritual truth for your toolkit to remind yourself, to reconnect yourself to the deep center, to the Holy Father and the Holy Mother that dwells within you, that, that really are your true parents. And when you recognize who the true parent is, you have greater respect for the ones that have been truly the surrogate that have ushered you along and helped you through many of the experiences of your world. So there's this, this um, shaman that I was reading also studying, and he, he shared his idea, because when I first heard, your children are not yours, I'm thinking, dang, they are too. You know, I just love my, my two birth children. And then I was welcomed in um, my stepdaughter, Sarah, many years later. And there's this mother bear energy around that. So I thought, what do you mean they're not mine? But they really belong to the holy parents. And we just have the gift of being given the opportunity. But this Alberto Vil Viloda, he is a shaman. And he said during the birthright um, of one of his children, everyone was gathered to, to welcome this, this individual into life. And he said, one starry night, soon after my daughter was born, I brought her to the campfire, held her squirmy little body towards the earth and prayed, mother, this is your child. I am just her caretaker. Then I held her up to the heavens saying, father, let her find her own destiny and let me help her to grow the seeds that are in her soul. Let me show her the seeds in the soul. Isn't that what we want? When we go to a parent, just knowing that there's something that we're trying to express in the, in the depths of our heart, these are the seeds of my soul. Will you help me? Will you guide me? Will you usher me into an experience that allows the highest and the best for myself and all people in my experience to be made manifest. This is the, the holy watch. Let me find, Father, let me find, let her find her own destiny and let me help her to grow the seeds in her soul. I dedicated her to her divine parents, acknowledging I'm only one provider of wisdom and protection and that she has her own road to travel. I felt humbled by the responsibility of being a parent but ushering my child into her own destiny by allowing her to look into Mother Earth and Father Sky for guidance made it easier for me to complete my own passage into parenthood. Then when I understood the adage that while you belong to your children, they do not belong to you, they belong to life. So Ernest Holmes gives us all the ways that we can stand confidently in our own truth to know that it's important for us to know what we're trusting, that we're allowing to come into our consciousness. Not a consciousness of fear or worry about our children. We do not want to manifest those experiences for our beloved children. But to be stewards of the consciousness in such a way that we only allow to be fed into the mind that which will serve mankind ultimately. So here is our, our opportunity to Tap in, the, he says, the ingredients for your accounts are love, faith, and peace. Love first. And that's where Abraham loved his son. They kept saying that in, that in that story. He loved his son so much, but the father loved even more.
and that idea of of recognizing that deep sense of peace and practicing all of your experience and expressions from that level of absolute agape love. It's a bigger love. It's a love that is a nameless love, a love that, that we can mostly feel but cannot quite name, but it, it is holding us. It is urging us. It is longing for us, this love. So this experience allowing it to continue to build in our, our accounts as we harmonize with this love and tap into the core of all our desires. And this idea of faith, faith, no matter what is outpictured in your world, stand in a knowing that you have the conviction that love is greater than whatever you're seeing out here, especially in these times. As I read the horrific stories about children being separated from their mothers in immigrant camps, I, I am my, my, it takes my heart to, to, the, to the ground. And yet I pour love there. There is a greater love, a greater experience unfolding that has those children, that is reuniting the energy of the parent to the child, to the father to the child, to the mother to the child. I have faith in humanity and I have faith and conviction in that, that that is so and that the third ingredient is peace. We leave our thoughts, we leave our thoughts with our children in peace, not worry. Peace and faith and love, those ingredients. So I invite you this week as you, as you meet with challenges and triggers, they come, but we reach into our spiritual toolkit. We rely on our spiritual bank accounts to lead the way to lead a higher way, to watch when it gets into the whiny, whiny areas, the worry areas. That's not what we want to outpicture. We want to continue to be the, the, the ones that make the change in the world that works for all. We started that a, a year ago, that campaign, that, that motto, let us create a world that works for all. Do you have to do it my way? No, but you have to do it your way based on spiritual truths. And when you live in alignment with that, you are the ambassador of love. You are that divine child of the one, and the Father is well pleased. So I leave you with this meditation. As we close right now, I just invite you to close your, close your eyes and, and relax in your body. No, your Father, your human Father, Maybe he was there always, and you raise him up so readily, beautifully. Maybe he's still here. Maybe you have an opportunity to reach back and just say thank you for what you could do. But maybe he was as well a distant father who knew no better. But we just relax and pour love into whatever it is. And in this knowing, as we recognize that we start with a place of God is love, and all the love there is is mine. Each one of us here now endeavoring to see something lovable in everyone you meet, in every situation you find yourself, find something lovable. It won't take long to find your way. Accumulate a greater degree of love and deposit it into the bank account of truth. Triggers come, we love bigger. Disappointment happens, forgiveness, compassion, love becomes bigger. Feel it in your own account. Be able to write a check on the bank of life that will cover every liability of hate and unkindness. That is words from Ernest Holmes. Feel now as you center yourself even more deeply into the love itself to bear on any situation where discord or strife seems to enter. Get quiet. It's so quiet inside. Where love prevails. Kind of feel it, 
beating from the heart space. Bring love to bear on the situation, whatever it is. Let love bear on the situation. Take away worry, let love bear on this situation. Love which comprehends and includes everything, a love which has no hurt, a love which is not afraid, a love which is calm, a love that is confident, a love that is sure of itself. An invitation from Ernest Holmes, a love so powerful, so revealing that we are set free, that our hearts swing wide open, and we welcome every hardship in the knowing that within us are the tools, is the courage, is the capacity, is the longing to stand in integrity and spiritual wisdom and truth and to allow ourselves to be quiet long enough to center into that knowing so that the next words that pass through the breath of our being are words that are a healing balm of truth, of love, of faith, of peace. This is our day to celebrate this deep knowing that we are united at the very core gifted with this place of absolute love, that it nourishes every part of our soul. These are the seeds that every parent has recognized as they cast their eyes the moment we were born upon us. As they saw these seeds of the beloved, it has been our duty to live life with love. So I give thanks right here and now for the courage and the willingness of each one here to arrive and to settle and to sit into a deeper understanding of how grand this life is. That at the moment, the moment of our biggest fear, whatever that might be, the biggest challenge, the angel appears. And we recognize that as we put God first, we put love first, all is well, and we are free. I give thanks for that absolute truth. Yeah, that's what we breathe. That's why we're here. That's what we're doing. Thank you, God. And so it is. Thank you. <laughs>